Yes. You're on one. Well, as with all things, let us begin in prayer. The Lord be with you. And with with thy spirit. Let us pray. For Almighty God, who of thy divine mercy has appointed the ministries of doctors of the church for the advancement of learning and knowledge and for the love of thee, we beseech thee that by the intercession of thy blessed doctor Thomas, we may in all things be enlightened with the vision of the angels, and so be preserved evermore for everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas and I have had a uh, long relationship. Uh, which is not something that most men say about someone who's been dead for like 700 years. Uh, I first I first encountered uh, the work of Thomas Aquinas when I was in college. And um, the thing I think about him that, that really captivated me was that here was a man who was absolutely convinced of the certainty of truth. Now that said, uh, Thomas has has both a really good reputation and a really bad rep um, in the church. And uh, particularly when it regards the spiritual life. Because... A lot of people assume that the intellectualism of his theology and the uh, intense, intensely logical nature of his theology means that he himself uh, and, and his and his approach to our Lord was also extremely dry. And nothing could be farther from the truth. Someone who doesn't have a deeply passionate relationship with Christ cannot write the Father. And I've got to read it to you. Now, this is from um, a hymn, which we actually probably already know, the Doro Te Devote, um, which he wrote concerning the most blessed sacrament of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and we know it as humbly I adore thee, verity unseen, whom thy glory hides me through shadows me. But our, our hymnal is missing several verses. So I'm going to read you um, some of the ones that are missing. Because I want you to understand I think, and I think this one, this one, this one verse might actually encapsulate everything that that should be said about uh, to mystic spirituality. Um, and once I read that, I guess I'm done. I'll, I'll uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, please, please, no! That's not how it's going. <laughs> Thy dread wounds, like Thomas. Though I cannot see, his be my confession, Lord and God of thee. Make my faith unfeigned, ever more increase. Give me hope unfading, love that cannot cease. Now someone who is not passionate about the Lord Jesus Christ cannot write that. In fact, um, the, the, the text of Adorate Devote is probably... Um, after the, the, the original patristic period and, and, the, and the late classical period of Christianity, St. Thomas Aquinas is probably actually one of the few medieval uh, hymn writers that stuck. People in the Middle Ages wrote a lot of hymns, and not a lot of them really stuck. But Thomas, the great theologian, the, the, the intellect of intellect, People always forget that his poetry stuck in the church. 
So here's why I said I want to I structure this in a way by parsing out and saying something about this little uh, stanza of a hymn. Okay, so what does it do? The first thing it does is it, it recalls a particular, a locus of, of, of Scripture, a location. It, it circumscribes a location in Scripture, okay, two of them, actually. It pulls together two locations in Scripture. The first is from the 21st chapter of St. John's Gospel. The upper room, one week after Easter. Y'all are probably, I mean, and, and I think, too, that Thomas Aquinas had a particular affinity for and love for Thomas the Apostle. You should, you should have seen that. Um, but I think you can definitely see in both a particular kind of approach to God that is both uh, both rich, richly mental and deeply passionate. Okay. So here's what he says. Thy dread wounds like Thomas, though I cannot see. Right. So remember that our Lord says, says, blessed are you who see, but more blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So Thomas says, though I can't see you, though I can't touch you, like Thomas did, Lord, I want my confession to be good. Thomas says, uh, and, and in fact, if we pay attention to John's Gospel, we know that actually what we don't know is whether or not Thomas actually put his hand in the side of our Lord. Our Lord invites him to, and it's almost as if the fact that he's like, come on, and he's like, that's cool, my Lord and my God, only, uh, almost as if to say, on Thomas's part, only you would be bold enough to ask him, to offer that, I should say. Um, so, first we have the locus of Scripture that we find in the 21st chapter of St. John's Gospel, tied to... Can y'all take a guess as to what it's tied to? Let me read it to you again. Make my faith unfainted, evermore increase. Give me hope unfading, love that cannot cease. What passage of Scripture do you think that's, it's tied to directly? Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, right? 13th chapter of the first epistle to the St. Paul's first epistle to the Which ends faith, hope, and charity. These three. But of these three, charity provides. So what Thomas does in his approach to Scripture, in his approach to the spiritual life and in his approach to theology is attempt to unify disparate elements into a cognitive and cognizable whole. Okay, so his first of all is the spirituality of wholeness. So that's, if you're taking notes, that's, that's point number one. Um, and that is a fascinating paradox because people tend to think of Thomas's theology as being very categorical. We've got to pin everything into its proper slot. Right? We've got to find the place where everything fits and pin it into its slot. People tend to think, well, okay, so we're going to buy this part, we're going to do this part, we're going to do this, and this little box right here. And they forget that his entire project is actually to take all of those disparate elements and pull them into a single unified whole. Father Stubbs is probably thinking, I don't remember any of this from the reading that I sent Father <laughs> That's because while I did read it, I kind of disagree. So... This is your pr- presentation, after almost, Father. After almost 13 years with Thomas, I feel like I feel like I can offer a different. Okay. So the first thing is that Thomas's is a spirituality primarily of wholeness and unity. The second thing that I want to point out is that his is one that intensely sees connections between Scripture and 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 one's one's actual spiritual life. Okay? In other words, it's it's a spirituality you might say of imitation. Okay? Thomas's notion of the of the of the best of the Christian life is that that life imitates the realities contained in scripture. So Thomas doesn't want to um, just live a moral life. He wants to actually live a life that exhibits biblical virtues as well as biblical uh, faith. Okay. Um, 
Again, that's an interesting contrast to how most of us think about the scholastic period in Christianity. We tend to think, uh, people tend to think of it, and it's been propagandized, as a time of severe decline away from Scripture. However, the historical record does not bear that out. Thomas Aquinas wrote uh, voluminously concerning the Gospels particularly. But it was also a time when a great deal of, of patristic learning was starting to be lost, uh, simply due to the degradation of physical texts. Okay? Here's, here's a big problem with books back then. It was really hard to get them reprinted. So if you had, for example, a, a work by Theophylact, who I, I love as a patristic father just because his name is so cool. Theophylact. <laughs> okay. Um, so... For example, if you had a work by Theophilites, who was not necessarily one of the one of the big names like Augustine or John Chrysostom or Origen, um, after a certain period of time, those texts would start to degrade, and it was, it was in that period, folks like Thomas were very very assiduous about getting as many of those pieces of those texts as they could, getting them copied, but also getting them uh, uh, compendiumized, if you will into works that showed how they flowed with the other patristic writers. So you had large, uh, voluminous writing about the scriptures that also tie uh, the scriptures to the wider Christian tradition. And if you're, and if you're looking for a good uh, commentary on the Gospels, um, you want to write down the words katena, plus yeah, I'll spell it for you. C A T E N A Aurea A U R E R A. I think. No. A U R E A. E A. Or A A. Yeah. It literally means the golden chain. And what it was is this idea that the text of Scripture. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was stringing together the chains of gold of the fathers. Right? The links of gold of the fathers. So it's a stringing together of, of, of commentaries by the patristic fathers on the gospel text. And the way it's broken up is it takes it just, it, it's the gospel text, a big chunk of it, and then everything that Thomas could find written about um, that particular text by the fathers. And arranged in such a way that and, and this is leading into uh, element number three of, of Thomistic uh, theology, spirituality, and spirituality. Um, arranged according to a specific pattern of reading holy scripture. So this is the next point. Is that the way that Thomas reads scripture is a direct reflection of how he read how how he prays. Okay. Thomas follows the pattern of the reading of scripture which is uh, we originally find in the church in the writings of St. John Cashin who um, was much older which, who, was, who far preceded Thomas Aquinas he actually uh, kind of cataloged and wrote down a lot of the stories of the early desert fathers so this would have been a writer uh, who, and, and he knew the direct those their direct disciples. So, um, so that would have that would have put him around the uh, what five six hundreds I think. Saint John Cashin was he five six hundred? Sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Got two priests in the room. We're just throwing darts. <laughs> the point is though, far far ahead. Of, and actually, it's worth noting that this would have been a pattern that was also followed. It might actually be earlier. Um, because this is also a similar pattern it's followed by Augustine, it's followed by the vast majority of the fathers of the church, and that's called the fourfold sense of scripture. Um, y'all ever heard of that before? Not? Okay, so what's what's the first what's the first traditional sense of scripture? I remember. It. What's, the, what's the first thing you do when you read what the this is it's in you now okay three sixty to four thirty five. Oh wow! Yeah, okay, well, like you know, fifth century is what I meant by five hundred. 
He doesn't get the answer. Okay. Um, what's the first thing you do when you read the Bible? This step might be so elementary you may even forget that you're doing it. Yeah. Say, say it again. <laughs> yes! You have to put your physical eyes on a page of scripture. Which is to say you have to do is the first thing you have to do is actually read the book. Um, I'm, not say, I'm not saying you personally. You know what I mean? I'm saying that, that what the first thing one has to do when reading Holy Scripture is actually physically put one's eyes on words on a page. Okay, and then has to endeavor to understand what those words mean in their literal sense. Okay, first sense of scripture is the literal and literary sense of scripture. Okay, we hear a lot of folks, and and Episcopalians really like saying this, and say, you know, I, I don't take the Bible literally. Well, then you don't read it. <laughs> that is a very serious problem. One must. Take the Bible at its literal sense. When I was studying theater at Swanee, we had this we had this persistent joke: designing plays would be really easy if it weren't for those stupid scripts. Okay, it would be really easy to to make art if no one bothered to put any kind. I could do whatever I wanted, except for that stupid script. I wanted to do I wanted to do Greece like in actual like the country of Greece except for the problem that you know oddly enough they don't have Ferris wheels. <laughs> you know I wanted to do Shakespeare but put it in you know I don't even know where except for the whole like I wanted to do a Shakespearean tragedy except that you know Midsummer Night's Dream is not. You know I mean that is one of those things where it's like you just can't you know you get the point. You have to read the Bible. Thomas says. You actually have to read the Bible, and you have to know what the text says and what it means. So a great deal of holistic <laughs> analysis of Scripture involves uh, it, it involves a very, very tight reading of the initial text. Okay. So that's the first thing. And so, if, and if you look in the Tanorea, the vast majority of the of the patristic quotations deal with the narrative, the structure of the narrative. The characters, the players, the literary elements and dimensions. Only once one has actually parsed and ascertained that can one then start to deal with the spiritual sense of the scripture. There are three. Um, once we de- once we dive past the literal level of scripture, what do you think? What do you think is the the next thing that the Bible tells us about? After it tells us a story, what's the next thing the Bible tells us about? In who? In yourself. In in God himself. Oh, in God. Okay, in God himself. But understand yourself. No, the Bible (laughs) says nothing about it. It says we go from faith to faith. In whom? Not in in me. Right. But, so my point is, okay, so God himself. So So first thing the Bible tells us about on a spiritual level is God. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Okay. Specifically, which person of the Godhead does the Bible spend most of its time telling us about? Jesus. It's the perfect Sunday school answer. <laughs> we call that the Christological. No, no, it's the right answer. We call that the Christological sense of scripture. Okay. <coughs> what does the Bible tell us about Jesus? The next sense of scripture after that, after it talks about Jesus, is what do you think it is? How to do what? <laughs> yeah, that's right. The moral level of scripture. Right? Also known as the tropological level, if you really want to impress your friends at cocktail parties. The tropological or moral sense of scripture tells us about how to live our lives. Now sometimes that moral sense can be bound uh, immediately <coughs> to the literal sense. So for example, the Ten Commandments. Right? The moral sense of scripture is the literal sense of scripture at that point. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, Paul's uh, the, the house tables in Ephesians and the chapter of Ephesians where it talks about husbands do this, wives do this, you know, children do this, etc. Like, you know, it kind of goes through like who's in the house and what's your expected role. That's a moral text. Right? Um, the moral level, how to live your life in balance the literal sense. Right? Right there. Um, which really makes a lot of people really mad, by the way. I don't know if you're those are the parts in the lectionary that get cut out inexplicably. Or actually, easily explained. 
people don't like reading that whole thing about, you know, I think you probably know it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I realized I'm on camera and that this will probably be played. It's on our website. That's on my website. My parents will see it. They'll get paid. <laughs> um, the, the, the next level of scripture is not so easily hey you want to taste interest thank you yes. you're a good man I don't care what these folks tell about <laughs> <laughs> um, okay so the next level of scripture the next sense of scripture after that is um, I'm not this is, a, this is a tricky one and people and, and, and a lot of folks a lot of Christians don't realize that this is in every single element of Scripture, just like all the rest of them, right? Mm-hmm. Every passage of Scripture contains some level or degree of, of all four senses of Scripture. Okay. The last, le- the last sense of Scripture is the, what's called the eschatological sense. Um, also a word to impress your friends with the cocktail parties, or lose all your friends, I'm not sure which. Um, this is a sense of Scripture that deals with the last things, the end of time, right? Um, the derives from the Greek word eschaton, which refers to uh, the, the final consummation of all things. Okay. So when Thomas reads the Bible, his analysis of the text of Scripture depends on a very tight, logical, and, and reasoned reading of the first sense in order to dive into and properly understand the three spiritual senses. The reason why, now that, that should seem, I think, that should seem self-evident. The Bible doesn't make much sense if you don't read it. That, we can, we can all go there with each other. The Bible doesn't make much sense if you don't read it. Um, most books don't make much sense if you don't read it. I'm told. Um, never stop me before, but I'm told. Um, so, with that understood, Thomas's Thomas's that 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 gives you kind of an, uh, an icon or a mirror to understand who Thomas was in his spiritual life. Everything you, that you might call the text of Christianity, right? The Bible, the Fathers, uh, the tradition of theology, uh, and even funny things that we may not think of as being deeply spiritual, like canon law. Liturgical rubrics, um, uh, the the rule of his religious order. Right? He was a Dominican, but I, I didn't really say much about who Thomas was in his real life. Okay, um, Thomas Aquinas was a Dominican and also a professor. Okay, um, Dominican meaning he was a uh, he was a begging friar, much much like the Franciscans. Slightly less unwashed. <laughs> um, the Dominicans and Franciscans actually occupied uh, neighboring houses at the University of Paris where Thomas Paul and his best friend was a Franciscan named St. Bonaventure, which uh, I guess Sunday night when I was hanging out with Father Stubbs, because you know, we do that sometimes, um, he, was, he about had a heart attack when I said, actually, I love St. Bonaventure the most out of all of them, but he just didn't write as much. So, I mean, yeah. um, <laughs> who's that? All of those, all of those medieval scholastics, though, kind of fundamentally rely on this idea that anything that pertained to the faith, anything that pertained to what we might call the text of Scripture, uh, contained the raw data that built, or the, the raw information that built uh, a holy life. Okay. Um, so for Thomas, things like philosophy or spiritual exercise, things like dogmatic theology or spiritual exercise, um, Things like the liturgy, and we, we tend to, and I don't mean the liturgy like going to mass. I mean the actual like study of the parts of the mass was a spiritual exercise. Um, 
canon law and rubrics or a spiritual exercise. Which if you can turn um, liturgical rubrics into a spiritual exercise, I think you've got something going for And I don't say that to be funny. It sounds funny, but I don't say that to be funny. If what we can do is look at the physical apprehension of the faith that happens in the services of, of the worship of the church and understand that even their minutest rule and regulation points to a, a greater reality outside of that discrete act of worship, then we're starting to understand God's project in the world. And that was kind of Thomas's thing. Point the next, because I've lost track of how many points I've Four. Clearly not a sermon. I only do three. In two. <laughs> <laughs> Probably thinking how much. We're going on fifth. Going, all right, so here's number five. Here's number five about Thomas. The overriding principle behind everything he did, and point number six is actually going to go into um, theology and spirituality. So, this is point number five is a setup to number six. Point number five is this: fides querens intellectum, which means it's it's actually a model. It's it's like emblazoned all over things. It's a model. Okay, faith seeking understanding. Thomas Aquinas is backwards from the modern rationalists, and for that reason, I think Thomas had definitely has it right. Okay. The rationalist, the modern rationalist says this. If you show me that I can understand it, then I'll believe it. There's a load of hogwash. No human being approaches anything like that. And I should know because I'm, my real job is in sales. Nobody buys anything for a rational reason. No, not, no matter how rational it is, they will not buy it unless they want it. Okay? Now, faith, we might say, for a Christian, is the want. Faith is the desire. Okay, Faith is the buying, if you will. Okay, It's not really a buying. Let's not get too technical about deposits on the treasury of merit and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> now, what I'm talking about here is that faith, for the, for the Christian, or it's better to say this, the, the gift of assent to the truth of God which is one component of faith given to us in baptism, is, uh, is, 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 a, is a measure or an indication of our desire for God. For Thomas, the desire for God and faith in God, because it's a gift given in the sacrament of holy baptism, which remember back then you were either a Catholic or a heretic, and that was it, Talking about the 1200s here. I really do know what Thomas was. Died in 1274. His buddy St. Bonaventure, oddly enough, was born only three years after him and died the same year. Um, they were considered such close spiritual brothers that one did not live with that. Pretty cool. Uh, Franciscans and Dominicans still get along, partially for that reason. Um, that was broke, so I mean, I guess I've got something to complain about. Okay. So. Thomas, what Thomas understands is that that is that faith, that, which is a gift given in, in baptism, in fact, um, is the prerequisite to understand anything at all. So it's believing, for example, and this is probably one of one of his greatest achievements, and refers to the doctrine of transubstantiation, is that believing that what the church has taught, in other words, that in the mass. The act of consecration, which is performed by a priest who acts in persona Christi, that is, it is Christ offering himself on the altar. So it's this, the spiritual charism, the sacrament of ordination, confecting the sacrament of the Holy Communion, actually brings about the event whereby Christ becomes truly present in the, in the elements of the Holy Communion, and the substance, the underlying substance of that bread stops being bread and starts and, and starts becoming the substance of the body of Christ. Okay. Body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. This isn't a sort of vague notion of real presence. That's what the what dogmatic, doctrinal 
transubstantiation is. It's the holiest of mysteries. Yes, exactly. Right, so it's the holiest of mysteries. Here's the question for Thomas. Huh? <laughs> How? But here's what he doesn't say. I don't get it, therefore it must not be true. What he says is, is this. I don't get it. God has something for me to learn. I don't get it, but the church, the Holy Ghost speaking through the church, has said this is the revealed truth of the faith. So my job is not to say, well, I don't get it, so I'm not buying it. But it's to say, I'm definitely in. I'm in with you, Lord, 100%. Help me understand. B days, clearings, intellect. Okay? Faith, a passionate faith, actually underlies everything that Thomas Aquinas does. Now, here's where we flip that around. We talk about theology and spirituality. Because for Thomas, the fact of faith is an underlying prerequisite for the life of the mind. It means that the mind has some catching up to do. Okay? He refers at one point um, in a discussion on faith and reason. He says it is not that we attempt to dilute the wine of faith with the water of reason, but rather that by the wine of faith we transform the water of the mind. So in other words, that's God's action through faith that transforms the, the uh, weakness of our own minds into uh, something as strong as faith. Now, this might surprise you. Y'all have heard of the Summa Theologia? The great masterwork of Thomas Aquinas, about five or six volumes long and several thousand pages. Um, that was a that was an elementary school textbook in twelve whatever it was eighty when it was finally finished several years after several years after Thomas died. That was like the elementary school textbook on theology. Now people like get Doctor Aquinas in it because I don't know maybe we're just not smart as it used to be, but. For Thomas, the very notion that one does theology as a beginning ground by which to apprehend faith um, is, is essential. Okay. Now bear in mind that this is a man who says, everything that the church has taught, I believe. Now I'm going to take those constraints, I'm going to take those boundaries and those borders, and I'm going to start working the field on the inside of that fence. Uh, a, a, a wonderful priest that I know of in Chicago called, uh, called Pat Reardon pointed out the point of dogmatic theology is to set the boundaries so that the rest of us can work the field in the middle. Okay? The idea of a fence is not to keep... The, the idea of the fence is to give us a, 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 a land to work. Okay? Thomas did the exact same thing. He said basically the exact same thing. The point of dogmatic theology was to set those boundaries past which we could not go in order to give us an idea of the, of the area that we would work, both in our minds and in our souls. So for Thomas, he begins in the center. Thomas begins in the center with who is God? Does he exist? Now he assumes that of course he does. And the best way that he knows of to explain that to people is to say he doesn't. The Thomistic method of theology is what's called syllogistic, so it's logical, but it also depends on a, on a debate back and forth about a questione disputante. The questione disputante assumes, and, and this is a beautiful thing I'm going to go into in a moment, assumes that no matter who you're arguing with, he's smart enough and deserves charity. And so the best way to show the truth of something is to give as much room for your opponent to be as strong as he possibly can and then show that the truth will still be. So in Thomas, if you, if you read a lot of, the, I would say the majority of his theological works, the way it's laid out is this. There's a proposition that we're going to discuss. And then the very first thing you get is five or six that are called objections. So, uh, for example, in the first article of the first book, it says, you know, uh, we, we proceed to the first article that God exists. Let's start. And the very first thing that he says after that is, let us suppose that he doesn't. 
And he starts going through arguments. Now, now in the 12, uh, in the mid 1200s, mid mid late 1200s, people did not just come out and say God doesn't exist. So this is pretty bold for him to actually put that down. Okay. And he comes up with some really strong arguments, some fierce arguments, and he deals with every single one of them with charity, with logic. He doesn't do any straw man, right? Um, you know, something like, let's pretend God exi- doesn't exist. Because we all know that God is a huge cookie monster out in space. Well, obviously that's going to be pretty easy. To do. Right. Thomas gives uh, gives extremely strong arguments against himself. And that, and, and that component, the idea of doing theology through charity, you don't do that very often. I mean, it's true. I'm right, you're wrong, and because you're wrong, you're probably going, where? Hell. Straight to hell. <laughs> <laughs> Look at what a good Christian I am. Thomas says, because you're wrong, I love you enough to try and change your mind. <laughs> and not by hitting you over the head with... with, with Thomas Aquinas hit one person over the head in his whole life. And then she became a nun. And the story is told that when he told his family he was very wealthy, Thomas was Thomas was like third or fourth in line, and so he wasn't going to really inherit anything, so the best way that his family figured to take care of him was to make him be a Benedictine abbot. And he was like, I don't want to do that. I want to be a broke Dominican. And they were like, no, 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 we can't have that. You need to at least be a wealthy Benedictine. Which, okay. Anyway, and so his brothers decided what we really need to do is get him sinning a little bit and not get him off this whole, like, being holy track. And so they put a, a woman of loose morals, and apparently they have a cat in the like, that phrase, in, in his room, in his version, uh, and, and he scourged her out with a, with a burning stick from the fireplace. And that encounter with a man so desirous for holiness changed the prostitute's mind. And she became a nun. At least that's the story. So anyway. But Thomas did far more than that because when 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 he went about debates, now some of the things in, in the Summa, for example, are issues that we would think of as being kind of contestable. Right? Um I'm, uh, you know, several. For example, there were so, there were several. There are many articles on the sacraments, many articles on baptism, where the opposite, excuse me, where the um, the opposing side, we might actually look at it and say, actually, yeah, I could I could kind of go for that because he didn't just treat things that were solely defined dogmatically, but things he was actually trying to also reason what the proper content of faith was. <laughs> so, for Thomas. The notion that one could apprehend truth and charity and then preserve and purvey it is the, is, is the next dimension of the spiritual life. There's a unity, again, in Thomas between the notion of loving someone and truth. And that's... So So all of us, I think, could stand... I mean, I, that sounds accusatory. <laughs> My point is, is that as a general rule, throughout our, our culture, I guess you might say, um, we could we could take a cue. <laughs> right, we could all take a cue. Okay. Uh, that should be point six. Mm-hmm. I had ten points in my head. We're wrapping up, and we're going to do this fast. Okay. Uh, point seven. The seventh point is this: is that um, the worldview of the scholastic mind is vastly different from ours. But that worldview, particularly with regard, um, this one, Liz and I were talking about this on the way up here, and we should all be thankful for her help because I assume that everyone knows what I'm talking about. She looked at me and said, "My wife is brilliant," and she was like, "What are you talking about?" So, okay. Um, point number seven is that the the philosophical and metaphysical outlook of the medieval mind. Is profoundly influential on their spirituality. And I think that's because that philosophical and, and metaphysical outlook on the world was right. 
Oh, it's only eight? Yeah, it's really only eight. That's oh, fast. I thought it was, I thought it was like eight yeah. giant. Yeah, that's fast. I know why he does that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised he told me it was only eight. <laughs> But I don't want I, I do I don't want to belabor things too much. Um, okay. But now you're distracted. So, <laughs> seven. seven philosophical philosophical and metaphysical outlook of the medieval mind has a profound influence on their spiritual lives. And part of that is because I think that I'm quite sure actually that that philosophical perspective on the world was right, and ours is very, very, very wrong. Let me underline the difference this way. Um, the medieval and the, and the scholastic theological world depended on what's called realist philosophy, realist metaphysics, which is the idea that real things really are real things, and that they're important. Um, Liz asked me to explain this. The word metaphysics does not mean that really ridiculous section of Barnes and Noble you go to where they have all the like Hindu books. <laughs> that has nothing to do with metaphysics. Okay, it's it's. I think it's a bunch of people who like. I don't even know where that came from. Metaphysics refers to a book written by Aristotle that sat next to his book called The Physics. It's in Greek. Meta means next to you. So in the Library of Alexandria, I'm not kidding. This is how it came about. In the Library of Alexandria, uh, Aristotle's book on the study of study of essential being sat next to his book about the study of being. Um, and so they just said, well, it's the book next to the Thusis. So it became Metaphusis. Which That's turns terrible. into metaphysics. <laughs> <laughs> the Dewey Decimal hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> For an entire branch of philosophy has grown up around a Dewey Decimal number. You want to think of that? Okay. So let me explain it to you this way. Okay. Physics deals with the study of the characteristic of things that exist. The characteristics of things that exist. Okay. Physics, in that regard, we forget about this. Carl Sagan and what's, what's the Neil deGrasse Tyson and whatnot. Physics is a lower order science. Philosophy is the highest occupation of the human mind below theology. It would be nice if people in philosophy departments would remember that. <laughs> okay, Physics without a philosophy of being to bolster it up is meaningless. Astrophysics, astrophysics is a very dull exercise in things that we probably cannot understand at all unless we have a wider scope by which to understand being as it exists. I say that because I'm probably on a video and somebody might see that. It's like, it's like Mayday. Like, please, please. Anyway, okay. Here's the point. Physics studies the characteristics of things that exist. Metaphysics studies being, things that exist in their essential being. What the, it asks the question, what does it mean to be? What is existence? You know, simple stuff, light stuff for a Tuesday evening. Okay. Now, it answers questions like, where do things, where do things come from? Not just on a physical level, but where, where, what is the origin of ex origins of existence? Okay. What are things for? How do you judge whether or not a thing uh, is excellent? We, te we tend to think of that in a moral category. And the reason why we think of it in a moral category is because we think that goodness is only related to acts that we perpetrate. Okay? But for the vast majority of humanity, Goodness was a transcendental concept that was related to the existence of things. Okay. This is this is point seven of Prime. <clears throat> Since now I know I have fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, point seven prime is this, or seven seven A is this. Okay. The the medieval mindset is fundamentally concerned with three things called the or 
are three things called the transcendence. Okay? Truth, beauty, and goodness. You might want to write these down. Because we hear these words a lot and have no idea what they mean. Goodness. Truth, beauty, and goodness. Truth, beauty, and goodness are actually characteristics of the existence of things. Okay? And truth has a definition. And next time you hear someone say, well, what is truth? You can actually say this, and if nothing else, it might make that person's head explode. Or you can call them a conscious pilot and see how they react. <clears throat> truth is defined as being as knowable. The ability to know how a thing is in its reality. Okay? And it's, and it's actual existence. Beauty. I usually I usually approach this as truth and goodness and beauty, but truth and beauty is fine. Okay. Beauty. Being as admirable and desirable. Goodness is being as lovable. You'll notice that for the medieval mind, the notion that real things really exist and have qualities and characteristics that are related to that essential existence would be a game changer because we don't tend to think that way. I'll give you an example. A friend of mine who's a philosopher at Elon College in uh, North Carolina said that realist metaphysics died when the United States switched away from the gold standard. Now, some of y'all, now we know what the gold standard is and we know what we're doing now is not the gold standard, right? What's the gold standard? Exactly. If I walked into a bank and put a dollar bill down and said, I want my gold, presumably they, now they may not have it on hand, right? But presumably each discrete unit of value is tied to a hard thing that you can have and hold on to. Right? What is money worth now? <laughs> Whatever. 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 Right. It's one of the reasons why I actually think that um, the philosophical underpinnings of a lot of libertarian and, and ultra conservative free market uh, theory is vastly unchristian. Because it assumes that all value can be dictated purely by arbitrary standards set by choice. Right? So if I don't think, for example, that my dollar, or rather it's better to say this, if I don't think that your cup of coffee is worth my dollar, then that has now established a relational value between your cup of coffee and my dollar. But here's the thing. What if you say my, co- my <coughs> cup of coffee can be exchanged at any given time for X number of grams of gold, and my dollar can be exchanged for that amount. You and I agree that thing of gold, well, that's an even exchange. Done. Value determined by a real thing that underlies both. Okay? I'm a big fan of gold stuff. Because I think that would change, oh man. How would that change people's minds? How would that change people? If the, we interact with money so often, I mean, I, I interact with it constantly, moment by moment by moment. I'm, the question is, will someone buy this? Is this how much is this going to cost somebody? That sort of thing. And in and, and my line of work, um, does that sneeze? No, I couldn't have a long part there. If you had sneezed, I would say bless you, but otherwise, are you okay? <laughs> may disagree with you on the economic side of it, but that's okay. The point that I'm trying to make, though, and, and economic debates are really fascinating because, in a way, economics is a branch of philosophy, not of uh, finance or of politics. Because it asks the question of what is value and what is being in relation to that. Okay. Now, for for a, a scholastic like Thomas, the idea was is that that any uh, or actually let me back this up. Now take this analogy of money for a second, and now let's change it from money into words. 
right? Uh, at the end of the medieval period, there's a fellow named Occam who espoused this notion called nominalism, which is basically that words connote signs that are arbitrarily determined. That are arbitrarily determined. Okay. So in other words, this fellow named Occam, who has a profound influence on Luther, kind of changed the game on how language and reality were supposed to interact. Okay. Um, that became pervasive throughout philosophical. Uh, the, the philosophical landscape up through Descartes and folks like Descartes and Kant who, who vastly started changing away from this idea that the reality of things had any bearing whatsoever on how we live our lives until you end up with this fellow named Hume. David Hume is terrible. I think he's a bad philosopher but everyone really likes him. Actually, a lot of people don't like him because he's Anyway, Hume had this idea that because you couldn't observe cause and effect, there was no such thing as cause and effect. So he'd say, because you can never observe the billiard balls, the cue ball striking the billiard ball, there was no way to rationally state and accurately state that, a, that the billiard ball, one billiard ball actually caused another billiard ball to move. To which someone posited, well, if that's the case, why don't you go stand in front of a cart and see what happens? He says, oh, no, 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 no. In one's study, one must be a philosopher, but in the drawing room, one must be a man. And I'm like, so, okay. So basically what you're saying is you know it's a load of hogwash. <laughs> so that came off the back of the course that was drawing the part. <laughs> but you're still going to posit this purely as a rational ex- exercise, and that was considered legitimate philosophy. Now, for someone like Thomas, the idea that you couldn't append the philosophy to the real life would have immediately said it's worthless. It cannot possibly be true because it's not in any way tied to being as such. Okay. So again, the the overarching point, seven, is that philosophy and metaphysics bears bears a profound relationship to spirituality for Thomas because his sole concern becomes how does theology speak to the truth of God's being. And as a corollary, how does theology speak to the truth of who God has made man to be? And a third corollary, what do we know about Christ from those two things? From the God made man, what do we know about Christ? Now I think Bob Stubbs is writing a sign in 10 minutes. <laughs> 15 minutes. We're done in 15? Yes. Okay. Good, I'm getting pretty close. 8. Point 8. Point 8. Faith in Jesus demands rigorous apprehension of Jesus with the mind in order to rule the passions The mind, mind, okay, the words mind over matter are close but not quite right, okay? It's fair to say this. The intellectual mind for Thomas has to be in control of and rule over the passions. Okay? There's a hierarchy of the intellect, or a hierarchy of the mind. The passions would be things like hunger, thirst, um, you know, libido, uh, desire for money, desire for... I mean, we tend to think of the passions as being kind of being negative. Uh, actually, you know, in passions like... Passions would also include things like desire for sleep. Anything that... Anything where the mind is kind of irrationally driven towards something. There's a passion, that is to say it's uh, from, from the Latin word passio, which means it's movable, right? It can be influenced, it can be swayed. Thomas, this idea that the mind that apprehends truth cannot be swayed because once it resides in the truth, which, bear in mind, that for Thomas has a being, right, in the person of Christ. For Thomas, truth has has an essential being in the person of Christ. And what that means is that the person, or the, the, the Christian mind that resides in the person of Christ is therefore immovable in the truth and is able to rule those movable parts of himself. Thomas is not a Gnostic. 
That is to say, Thomas does not view having passions as intrinsically evil. But he does say that they are, at first, highly disordered. For Thomas, the idea that once you have apprehended truth with the mind, it is therefore able to, to, well, I mean, to use a nice Texas metaphor, is able to corral the passions and direct them towards their proper end, is an essential uh, goal, telos, of the spiritual life. Now that's why, jumping back to our uh, our little bit of poetry from the beginning of all this, um, it's so important to see where Thomas was in terms of, of the spiritual life. And this is actually really coming... I'm, I'm, I'm trying to drill down to the crux of who he was. Right? The idea here is this, is that Thomas spent so much time training his mom. Okay? It's worthwhile to notice he also, at the same time, was spending a lot of time training his body. Um, he fasted a lot. A lot of people say he was really fat. And he was apparently he was just he was just big bone. He was just a big he was just a big old Italian boy, okay? <laughs> We don't really have. There, there's this thing people say about like Thomas was so fat that they had to like, you know, cut a hole out for his belly on his desk. So here's the problem: they didn't have desks. They didn't exist like we think of like a desk in an office. It didn't exist. They, they desks were those were lecterns. You stood, or or they were about this big and they sat away from you because you wrote at a distance. Because your writing was not like a, a close scratch for you to be able to read. It was usually bold and large enough for other people to be able to read. And you spoke out loud when you did it. So you didn't have a private... I mean, there were no private, quiet places. You were in scriptorians. So Thomas Aquinas was not fat and did not have a desk with a hole cut out for his stomach. Okay? So it didn't happen. <laughs> Paul Stubbs was the last person I heard to perpetuate that man. <laughs> Don't need to point that out. <laughs> anyway, um, I spent a lot of time training his body. Okay, fasting, mortification. Um, Dominican spirituality back then involved a lot of whipping oneself in an iron chain thing. Don't suggest replicating that part of their spiritual life. Um, just, just not a good idea. Um, you know, if, you th- if you're thinking about it, talk to a psychiatrist and a priest. <laughs> Hopefully they're not the same. Um, but Thomas spent a lot of time training his body with mortifications, but he also spent as, he spent as much time uh, training his mind for the purpose of directing the passions. The result of that is the poetry uh, or the, the well, that's not the old, that's well. Sorry, that's the artifact of that. That's the best way to put it. That's the artifact. That's what we have left behind. The result of Thomas's intense passion for Christ, which is a directed passion. Okay, think about it this way: if if our passions are in a lot of cases like um, water in a bucket full of holes, how much damage does any one of those individual little streams? Do like if you're trying to wash something out and you've got one little trickle, how much washing does that do? Not much. Okay. Um, what happens when you seal up all the holes? You got a bucket full of water and you pour it down on something hard to clean it off. Pretty effective, right? You take all the power of all that weight of water, whatever it may be, and focus it in one direction, and it's it stops being a sprinkle and starts being a pressure washer, right? Actually, that's a much better analogy. Let me use that one. You know the little garden head, you know, hose things that's got the little holes in it, and each little individual stream, it's like. Mm-mm. But what happens when you when you direct it, when you tighten it down, and you get a pump behind it? Then you're like, you know, scrubbing road tar off with a <laughs> garden. Right. Thomas's passions were directed by a mind that completely ruled them. Okay. Now, he didn't get that way on his own. Because remember, we started back with Fides, Corinth, and Philippi. What The reason why his mind got to the place where it was able to rule his own internal passions 
was because it that had prior had been enlightened by the faith of Christ prior to that ability to, to control the passions. Okay. Five minutes? Seven, seven minutes? I'm halfway through? God, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm having fun. I don't know. I mean, I really... I really don't. Okay. I don't understand all of it. <laughs> number number nine. Number nine. Point number nine. Recap point number eight because I'm, I'm, that really drills down to the the essence. I would say the core of what mystic spirituality is about. Okay, is 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 allowing the grace of God to so conform our minds that our minds can form our passions. Okay, and direct our passions towards their proper goal, which is Christ. Point number nine. In order to under in, in order to have a mind that is so enlightened, okay, um, involves the entire person. So this is the sacramental dimension of Thomistic spirituality. Remember how when I was talking about B.A. Spirit and I, I, I gave the example of Thomas Hurd the dogma of, of transubstantiation and said, I don't understand it, but I, I better. Instead of saying, I don't understand it, therefore I'm throwing it out, he said, I don't understand it, so I better pray and study. Um, that is, and that, how that's not our common reaction to things anymore. Okay. Um, for Thomas, because, for, for several reasons, all of which are bound with that theology, I think I've never wound up if nothing else because George and Bobby are probably kind of over it. Okay. Um, okay. So, for Thomas, knowing what he knew from, from the scriptures about who God is and about who man is, um, this is th- so this is a Christian who is intensely uh, concerned with the unity between the physical and spiritual. Um, no, I don't think I don't think I want to bring up the corporeal versus non corporeal substance. So never mind. Okay. Um, the point though is this: is that for for Thomas, the notion that um, corporeal matter matters. He's really he's like the he's like the, the the knight champion of that idea in Christianity. Is that the physical body really matters? And that God interacting with and intimate with the physical body bears a direct and and an immense uh, effect on the soul. That a physical cause, that a that a physical cause that is the the substantial body and blood of Christ in the Holy Eucharist, in the Blessed Sacrament, is actually able to affect change, real change, in the soul, the non corporeal part of the Christian. Let me say that again. The physical reality of the Blessed Sacrament, okay, the physical reality of the body and blood of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, for Thomas, uh, he's the champion of the idea that that physical reality affects a spiritual change in a Christian. Now, that is a vastly... Uh, that, that is an incredibly... Um, that, that is an incredibly traditional thing in Christianity. He did not come up with the idea, but he's the one that actually espouses it as a spiritual principle to, to help guide people. Okay. So that's point number nine. The sacramentality of the world, the, sacramental, the sacramentality of the world, that is the unity between the spiritual and the physical parts of the world, okay, is part of God's plan to bring the world uh, to heaven. Point number ten, and we're about done. It's maybe not as earth shattering as you It's kind of a summer. A lot of propaganda and misinformation and an attempt to kind of downplay 
um, the effect of both Thomas and of, and of scholastic spirituality in, in, in uh, the Christian West particularly has done a lot of damage from the fruit that can be derived from it. Point number 10 is about how we appropriate some of that. Um, point 10a, appropriation point number 1, is this. Is that as we read the Holy Scriptures, and as we approach works of theology and things like that, we need to be... Well, sorry, as we approach works of theology, and particularly as they comment on Scripture, we need to be very, very careful of what might seem like an over-spiritualized reading that doesn't take into account the seriousness of the text. Conversely, we need to be very, very careful of any reading of Scripture that solely deals with what's in the text and takes it no further. Okay? So that would be avoiding pretty much anything put out by the Episcopal Church in the last 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> and anything written by a German Lutheran in the 19th century on the other. Okay? And I say that not to be pejorative, but because those are big trends, right? Liberal, uh, liberal spirituality, and I mean that in its classic sort of academic sense of liberal spirituality that is um, deriving from about the early 1800s till now, um, has largely tried to represent scripture and, and the spiritual life as something that solely engages the spiritual part of one's life. Okay, um, In that regard, it's slightly Gnostic and terribly dull. On the other hand, other parts of, of the, the, what we might call the liberal project, um, and particularly on the European continent, tried very, very hard to divorce the spiritual senses of Scripture from the literal and literary sense that we find on the surface. That's why we find um, priests on the one hand who will permit anything and know nothing about the Bible on one side, and uh, professors who know everything about the Bible and believe strictly none of it on the other. Okay? So we need to be very careful of that. And the reason why those... And, and it's worth noting, I, I use the, the, the liberal theological project as a, a... That's not... I know that's kind of a boogeyman around here, but the fact is, is, is a lot, a lot of so-called conservative evangelical theology does the exact same thing. It attempts to either divorce, um, it attempts to divorce uh, the Christian life from either anything physical, saying things, for example, like fasting, mortification, uh, attempting to direct what you actually do with your body. I know, I know, we're almost done. <laughs> Literally, I'm on my, I'm, I'm, I'm on point 10A. I've, I've got to get to point 10C, then I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the thing is this: if any time we, we apprehend, so this, so this is ten a. Any time we apprehend that that um, that any version of the faith is attempting to pull apart the spiritual and the physical, we need to be very, very careful. Now, I don't say reject it out of hand, because you know, remember another component of of, of Thomistic spirituality. Is, is, is immense charity, particularly with folks that we may not agree with, okay? or that we might look at look upon as as a as, as an opponent. So that's 10b. 10b is this: is that is that theology is a means of practicing charity. Okay, without charity, I'm nothing. Uh, theology is a means of practicing charity. And the way that we do that is a particularly rigorous way that we do that. And that is by trying to make our opponent as strong as he or she can possibly be. Think about a, think about a theological debate that you may have had with someone where they're like, you know, I just don't believe any of that stuff. And you're like, you're probably right. Let me tell you five more things you may not even know about. I'll give them to you. The sixth one's free. Right? So that's the so so that's the the particularly Thomistic way is to show charity to one's opponent by actually getting behind the opponent like rooting them on. It's crazy. It's like a cheerleader playing on both sides. Okay. Ten. C. Last and final. One. Okay. Um. It's okay to be. 
passionate. It's particularly okay to be passionate about the faith, but we need to train ourselves through the disciplines of the sacraments and through living in the community of the church, or rather be trained by those disciplines, to order those passions in a direction. Okay? If you're passionate about quilting and you spend so much of your time doing it, I don't know if anybody here is passionate about quilting. I'm literally. Um, if you're passionate about quilting and, and you're so passionate about it that you that you ignore your grandkids and you just have a house full of, of quilts and really cold people outside, have you done Christian work with your passion? But what if you're really, really passionate about making blankets? And the, and the orientation of that is to do charity for the poor. Right? If the orientation of that is to teach your grandkids, is to say, this is a wonderful time for us to spend as a family, so that we can then take it a step further and go out as a family and put blankets around homeless people. That would be gospel work. Right? That would be gospel passion. And there is joy to be found in that. That's one example. I'm out of time. So I'll end on this. Um, Thomas Aquinas' nickname for his is the angelic doctor. And the claim is that his face so radiated with the internal light of God's grace that he didn't need candles to read his books. That the light of the angel shone out of his face so that he could continue to apprehend the faith. Now that said, Thomas ended his life by saying this. He took his greatest work of theology and fell down before the altar of God and said, Lord, this is the best that I could do. What do you want? And and his brother priests were around him. And apparently the legend is that Jesus came off the cross and said, Thomas, it's enough. And not too long after that, Thomas says it's all strong. It's all strong. Because in the moment, because what Thomas knew is this, is that in the moment and the culmination of seeing Jesus, all other things in this world have faded in importance. The orientation of Thomas's mind, directing his passions, was so that he could see with physical eyes and see with his eyes the face of Jesus. Thomas has a great reputation and a really bad rap. He has a great reputation as a theologian and a really bad rap as a saint. Because people assume that because he used his head that he was dry and dull and dull. And yet I cannot imagine that there is a fiery Italian who who scored, who, who scourged out loose women and fought uh, and, and, and fought heretics and championed the faith of God and even teased nuns who got proud about their ability to levitate. That's a story from the time. <laughs> that that man was wrong. And when we appropriate the kind of spiritual life that he, he offers, we find that instead of running dry, we, we become we become people who are open to receive the grace of God and to have that poured into us and into our lives. Questions? Thank you. So I think I just played talk for like an hour and a half. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, we know somebody else who can do that too. <laughs> Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be.